All right, we are ready to get into the word today. You ready for your assignment from heaven? Ready. I know I am. I know I am. And uh, I also know that Marcel will <coughs> sneak a quotation of the day in before I tell you where to go. There it is. False friends are like a shadow. False friends are like our shadow, keeping close to us when we walk in the sunshine, but leaving us. Uh, the instant we cross into the shade. Wow. <laughs> hey, hey. Wow, true. False friends. False friends. I got one that counteracts that. True friends. It says a star shine at night. Let that dangle for a minute. You get it? A star shine at night. So those are true ones, but false ones, watch out for them. Close to us when we walk in the sunshine, but leaving the instant we cross to the shade. Boy, that's, isn't that true? Thank you for it, Brother Marcel. That's right. Thank God for his unchanged hand. Most definitely. Well, since you have your Bibles with you, I'd like for you to open up with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And continuing with our, our series, we, we're dealing with predestined or predestination. What part does it play in our lives? Has a lot to play, and you're going to see today. We, we kind of hit on it a little bit last week concerning Jonah. But I'm going to use Ephesians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 as our foundational scripture. Start with verse 9, if you would. And let's stand to our feet for the reading of the word. Chapter 1. First chapter, Paul talking to us, the apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Starting with verses, verse 9, we're going to go to verse 12. And it reads, having made known to us, talking about the church, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined. Everyone say predestined. predestined. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for this message today that you prepared in my heart for this people, your flock. I pray for your anointing to stand in this office as pastor, teacher, to this congregation. And Lord, I pray that it not be my voice that's heard, but yours, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us through the scripture, uh, revealing to us the truths that transform our lives. So, Father, we pray that you would, you, would, you would meet us where we are, that you would grant us a word in due season, feed us fresh manna from heaven. And we give you the praise for the results in Jesus' name. Those in agreement said amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. Today's message is entitled Predestined, A Lesson from Jonah. A Lesson from Jonah. We started to hit on it last week, but I didn't want to go too deep because uh, it, would, it would stretch it out too long. So we kind of broke this up uh, so we can, we can deal with it in bite-sized nuggets. Amen. And, uh, uh, I like sweet and sour sauce with my nuggets when we do have them. But uh, uh, anyway, just <laughs> trying to wake you up. That's all. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna deal with predestined uh, today, uh, and hopefully wrap that up so that we can go into our, our fourth stage. This is the third stage of God's eternal plan that we're involved in right now, and uh, I believe that as we we go through the scriptures concerning. His plan is laid out for us. It helps us to better cooperate with the Holy Spirit in our daily living. But uh, in the third stage, the third stage, we find that we are predestined. Predestined and we find out also that that uh, part of God's plan is actually from eternity. Time hasn't begun yet. And before the foundation of the world, he predestined us. He already had a destination mapped out. For us. And we've looked at it scripturally speaking. We've seen four places where Paul mentions our predestination. And uh, there's a practical side to it that I want to deal with today that I think you'll be able to use 
uh, right away. I'm going to have about three PowerPoints for you. Uh, the first two are pretty short. The last one will be the average of what we usually get, but I'm going to try to give it to you where you can you can really take it home and develop it yourself. You can improve on 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 the lesson that I'm giving today. But in regards to the practical side of predestination, uh, we can see that God provides for our mistakes as well. How many of you have ever made a mistake before? <laughs> you have, huh? Uh, did you know that God provides for the mistakes that we do make? I mean, he's not just, he just, he just planned out all the good for us, but he's also planned out all the bad that we might do along the way. He's predestined be predestined for us to come out on top in the end. Amen? So, what do I mean by providing for our mistakes? Well, here's what God does, if you haven't noticed already in your own life, but God anticipates our mistakes, and what he has done already is he has provided or prepared various ways to deliver us from these mistakes by his grace. It's by grace alone that he does this. Not anything that we deserve, but for his name's sake, you'll find in, in a lot of the prayers, I want you to do this for your name's sake, oh God. You know, it, it's because we're, we're too corrupt and too wicked uh, to ask you to do that on our behalf because we don't deserve it. But because of your loving kindness and for your name's sake, uh, we, need, we need a change. We need something. But you can see this readily in Jonah's life. You can see it really clear. As far as Jonah was concerned. Now, what we touched on last week, I'm going to give you a, a little overview of that to go into our message for today. But what happened in Jonah's life that gives us a clearer picture of this, this truth? Well, just a little background on Jonah from what we said last week. See, Jonah was called by God uh, from the mountains of Galilee to go east, where Nineveh was. He was called from the mountains of Galilee. Everybody say mountains. 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 You realize that mountains are up high. If you live in Colorado, the air might be a little thinner. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you <coughs> jog and you live in and you and you decide to go jog in Colorado, you probably won't be able to jog as far because of the, the air being as thin. But Jonah was in the mountains of Galilee and he was called by God to go <laughs> east to Nineveh. Problem. The problem was Jonah was an Israelite. An Israelite now. I'm not making this racial. <laughs> but the problem with him being an Israelite was who Nineveh was to the Israelites. See, Nineveh uh, to the Israelites, that was, uh, uh, that was the, uh, the capital city of Assyria. That was Israel's enemy. Keep that in mind. Uh, Noah, I keep saying Noah, Jonah, his problem wasn't just being an Israelite, but what his problem actually was was he was patriotic. In his Israeliteness, <laughs> you know what I mean? He was very patriotic, and nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But it can blind you to being godly. It can blind you to what God has called you to do. It can desensitize you to what the Word of God says. You see, Jonah was an Israelite, and Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, and that was Israel's enemy. Now, make note of this of Jonah's pathway after he refused to obey God. Realizing that God wants to preach to Nineveh so that they would repent, Jonah refused to do so. But make note of his pathway after he refused to obey God. It was actually five steps to his pathway where he spiraled downward. Uh, number one, he was called, I told you to repeat after me, mountains, right? He was called from the mountains, the mountains of Galilee. But he went from the mountains to the foothills, number one. Number two, he went from the foothills to the plains. You see that? And number three, he went from the plains to the port. Number four, he went from the port to the ship. And number five, he went from the ship to the sea. So he starts in the mountains, and he ends up in the sea. Can you see that? He refuses to obey God to go east where Nineveh is. Rather, he goes down to the port where the ship is, and into the sea. So here's a warning that I want to give to you. You can see here's the, the Bible uh, is basically made up of, of two things. you got examples on the one hand, and you have warnings on the other hand. You see? Uh, we, want, we want, basically, we want to live by all of it. You know, but you want your life to be an example and not a warning. You see? 
So your first PowerPoint for today is don't refuse the call of God. He says, don't refuse the call of God or you will spy, spiral downward. That's basically it. The minute you refuse the call of God, there's nowhere else to go but down. It gets worse and worse, too. When God tells you to do something, until you do it, it gets worse and worse. You see, it gets harder and harder. It says the way of the transgressor is hard. I'm always making mental note whenever I see people having a hard way in life. I'm wondering if they, how's their hearing? You know what I mean? If you can't hear what God is saying to you and you do your own thing, it's going to make things rough on you. It's going to make things harder on you. You see, God doesn't have to do anything to you. Life just happens. Life happens to you. Basically, what happens, I mean, when life does happen to you, though, I need to give you a scriptural reason for that. See, you leave yourself open for the devil to do some, some things to you. Don't forget that we have an enemy. An enemy. Satan lurks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That means that he can't devour anybody he chooses. He can't just jump on somebody just because he feels like it. He has to have permission whom he may devour. Anybody ever play Mother May I? You see, I don't think I've played that before. But may I, you know, you have to have permission. And what gives him his permission a lot of times is one of two things. It's either rebellion or ignorance. If it's going to be either one, I'd rather be ignorance because, see, you can fix ignorance. <laughs> you can fix ignorance with information. You see, if I know what to do, then I'm, I'm now I'm not ignorant anymore. It's just like cutting the light on. Why bump into furniture that's been moved around? When all you have to do is cut the light off. <laughs> you see that? Some people fail to do so, so they continue through life bumping into furniture. It's either through ignorance or rebellion, refusal to turn the light on. The Word of God is our light. Amen. Man. You see that? Your Word is a light into my feet, a, a lamp into my path, a lamp into my feet. You see what? His Word, it, it's, it's light. It's, it's light when we get the entrance of it. It brings light. It brings understanding to the simple. That's what the Word of God does. I, I have to have light so that I can see where I'm going. But the way of the transgressor is hard because he chooses his own way. And here's Jonah choosing his own way. So life is starting to get hard for him, as we're going to see uh, here in a few seconds. But I want you to write down your second PowerPoint. We're going to move kind of fast. Second PowerPoint. Did you get the first one? Yeah. Number two. God has a plan worked out for us. Amen. That's correct. Even if we refuse the call and we make life hard on ourselves, the good news is God has prepared a way for us. He's already prepared or worked out a plan for us. Remember, he has various ways of delivering us. He's not going to make it easy for you to refuse it. <laughs> you see that? Right. Now, eventually, he will turn you over to a reprobate mind if you just absolutely refuse. But ultimately, God works with us because of his grace. His grace is amazing. That's why we have a song about it. <laughs> amazing grace. You see? It's amazing. I mean, where we would give up on somebody, God doesn't. God doesn't give up. And here's, here's another reason why God doesn't give up on us is because, you know, uh, he has eternity. We're the ones that have time. You run out of time, God still has eternity. He'll go after your kids. <laughs> you see, that if you don't refuse them. I, I wondered sometimes if my dad was called to preach and he didn't do it. He didn't do it. So now here I am. He's got me in here preaching now. What in the world happened? I'm glad I did, though, otherwise. But like I said, it's not a bad thing. I like preaching. You know, I, I wouldn't mind my children preaching, too, but I want them to do whatever God has called them to do. You see that? You know, but God can wait on you. He can get wait on your children if you won't, if you won't do it in your lifetime because he has eternity. We're the ones who have time. And time is the most valuable or precious asset that we have. You can lose money and get that back. But if you lose time, that's gone forever. You see that? So you can't waste time. You don't have any time to waste. Because God gave us time and everything has a purpose. He gave us time so that we'll fulfill his purpose in that time. We only have time to do what he called us to do. Anything else is a waste of time. You see? So we don't want to waste it. But I want you to look at Jonah, if you would, so we can see how God works these things out in our lives. Jonah. Jonah. Jonah is right after Obadiah. Did that help? Yes. Right before Micah. And if you have a hard time finding it, 
Go to the front of your Bible. If you don't have an electronic device to help you find it. <coughs> it's on page 1196 in my Bible. <laughs> if that would help you out. But Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, see, you can't refuse to call of God or you'll spiral downward. And God has a plan worked out for us in case we do. Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. And we saw that Jonah made his way to the sea. But it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Now notice this. They said that the Lord sent this storm. The Lord sent this storm. You notice that? Uh, it's amazing how in life, if you find yourself going the wrong direction, whether it be in rebellion or in, dis uh, in, in, in uh, uh, what did I say earlier, <coughs> ignorance, you know, a lot of times, and more times than not, it's in rebellion. If you're going the wrong way in rebellion, you notice how hard it is? It is because God has placed a roadblock in your way. You see, that? see, God put roadblocks in your way to make it difficult for you to disobey it. Or to make it uncomfortable for you to stay in disobedience. You see, God sent this storm right here. Now, we know that Satan is the author of confusion. He's the one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But this particular storm was sent by God. Now, all storms are, are sent by God. Keep that in mind. Because remember, Jesus was on the boat with the disciples and there was a storm. That wasn't sent by God. Otherwise, he wouldn't have rebuked it. You see? Now, that one was a demonic storm. And really, you know, uh, uh, technically, now this is one I won't charge you for. It's amazing how we get to those places in the message where I don't charge you for certain things. I'm trying to give you some freebies, see? And I love you. I love you. That's why I won't charge you for this. But when Jesus... Rebuke the wind and the waves. Wind, peace, waves, be still. And he tells his disciples, he says, where is your faith? Remember? Uh, uh, shortly after that episode, what ended up happening was they arrived on the shore. And that's when the madmen of Gadara came. And he delivered them from those demonic spirits. That's when the spirits went into the pigs and went into the ocean. So putting those together, you realize that this storm was demonic in Jesus' case, trying to keep him from going to bring deliverance to this man. You remember that? So he was really speaking to the demon powers behind that storm that was trying to keep Jesus from reaching his destiny. In this case, Jonah is on a ship with some, some uh, uh, with, with, with a, a bunch of pagan sailors, and it says that the Lord sends this storm in order to shake everybody up. Now, when you look at the, uh, the scene, the ship is about to be broken up, and they're throwing everything overboard trying to save everybody. They're throwing cargo over. Now, this is, this is a business that's, that's being wrecked, you see? And it got to a place where now we got to figure out something. Something's going on. Somebody's on this ship that caused this storm, and they cast lots, and it fell on Jonah. They came to Jonah, and Jonah was asleep, just like Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Except for Jesus was asleep in his obedience. Jonah was asleep in his disobedience. They woke him up and said, hey, man. Are you the cause of this storm? What's going on? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm the cause. I'm an Israelite. And we first of all, find out who he was. I'm an Israelite. I, I worship the true and living God and so on and so forth. You worship the true and living God. You need to do something about this storm. Well, Jonah already wanted to die. He'd rather die than to go and preach to Nineveh. So he just tells him, here's the solution. You throw me overboard and everything will be all right. You remember that? You might not, but if you read the story of Jonah, it's only about two pages long, four chapters. Real quick read, but a lot of information, a wealth of information that you would gain from it. God sent that storm, and it stirred up everybody on there. Now, what's crazy about it is, even in Jonah's mistake, in God sending the storm, I believe that those, those pagan sailors probably ended up worshiping the God of Israel because of that. You see? See, sometimes you're your best witness when you're not aware of it. Jonah was a good witness, even though he was, he was uh, in disobedience. He acknowledged who he was and who the God he served. And then he gave them the remedy and the miracle took place. Everything was cool after they threw Jonah overboard. And I'm sure they felt bad about that. You know, but they had to they had to survive. They had to make it. You see that? But God sent that great storm. Uh, that was to block Jonah in his disobedience. Now what you look at this, look at verse 17 though. It says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. To swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish 
three days and three nights. Some versions might say it this way. Now the Lord appointed a great fish. How many of your versions says appointed? Anybody say appointed? New American Standard Version says appointed. But here it says in my Bible that he had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. It was appointed. Now here's something interesting to think about when you read that. What if that fish had to swim about 50 miles to get to Jonah once he was thrown overboard? Jonah probably would have died. However, they threw him overboard at the right place at the right time. The storm stops and the fish swallows Jonah and he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, you already got number one that God sent this storm to block Jonah. Then he appointed or prepared a fish to swallow him at that point in place and time in the sea. You see that? So he's protected now. If he was 50 miles away, that, that fish would have, or that Jonah would have died. He would have drowned in there. That, everybody say predestination. 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 You see the value in it. Now see, it was in the mind or in the belly of the fish that Jonah's mind changed. He changed his mind. Now you see his prayer as you read his prayer. He wasn't praying that God would deliver him from the fish. In fact, I, I realize now just in, in, in studying this out, <clears throat> when you read to the end of it, Jonah wished he was dead. So if you look at a man who already wishes he was dead, he's not afraid inside this fish. He's not really afraid. But rather, he is thankful that God sent the fish because he didn't want to drown. You see? He didn't want to drown. So as he's thanking God in this fish, which is, according to our New Testament mindset, we're giving thanks in everything. For this is the will of God concerning us in Christ Jesus. We give thanks in everything. Here's Jonah acting like a New Testament believer by giving thanks inside the fish. That's what he was doing, inside the fish. Now, don't get me wrong. We're to give thanks in everything, not for everything. Okay? You don't thank God for giving you AIDS. God doesn't give you AIDS. He doesn't have any AIDS to give. You know, whatever he has to give is from heaven. There ain't any AIDS in heaven. You see, no cancer in heaven, nothing like that. No Asian flu, no... No African flu, whatever flu there is, there's nothing like that in heaven for God to give you. God has blessing to give you. He says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He gives you good things, you see. It's our job to discern the good from the bad, and we give thanks not for everything, but in everything. Here's Jonah. He's giving thanks in the belly of the fish. That giving thanks made, made Jonah taste bad to the whale, to the fish, to where he spits him up on the shores of Galilee. I'm sorry, on the shores of Nineveh. You see that? He spits him up at Nineveh. In the fish, he changed his mind. That's amazing. God called him, uh, he, at, at that point, that's when uh, he started to do what God called him to do. And Nineveh was spared because of it. He was spared because of it. Uh, what do you think Nineveh's response to Jonah's message was? Now, they see a man coming out of a fish, and he probably was all, you know, pale with seaweed on him, looked like he was about to be digested. To them, he was a dead man, came back alive. And that was a sign uh, that Jesus used concerning Jonah that, just like Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth for three days and three nights. You see so here comes this dead man back to life to preach to a, 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 a Israel's enemies, and they repented. They repent. So they rejoice. But what do you think Jonah's response to that was? Any idea? Exactly. In fact, he went off to himself and he pouted about it. He had a bad, a bad attitude about it. Remember, he was patriotic. That's really something to keep note of, that he was patriotic, so much so to the point that he couldn't even rejoice over Nineveh repenting. Yeah. He still pounded about it. He went off and pounded about it. So what did God do? Uh, Jonah was miserable, but make note of this, that he went to a place, when he pounded, he went off to a place uh, and sat in an exposed area that overlooked Nineveh, where uh, it got miserably hot. Now, he was overlooking Nineveh to see if God would still judge him or not. And uh, there was a place where uh, God sent a strong, hot wind pocket to blow on him. 
and it caused him to be miserable for a minute. But look at this, chapter four, chapter four verse seven in, in uh, John. Look, I'm taking you too far. Look at verse six. Chapter four, verse six, it says, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He was very grateful for the plant. Now, how was Jonah about the plant? What was that? He was happy. But as far as Nineveh, Nineveh was concerned, that kept him from, from being enthusiastic about Nineveh. Nineveh was getting in the way of his happiness over this plant. So what did God do? Verse 7, it says, But as morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm. Now you notice in these two verses of Scripture, verse 6 says, He prepared a plant. Prepared, that means He appointed this plant to take care of Jonah right there. But verse 7 says, He prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened that when the sun arose, that God prepared a vehement east wind as the, sun, as the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. Very interesting. Now you notice the word appointed or prepared in there, right? He keeps saying that. He prepared this and he did that for him. Uh, so what big deal is that? What, what's the big deal about that? See, God didn't uh, approve of what Jonah did, but because he, has, or he was predestined, ultimately God got his glory. You see that? He didn't approve of what Jonah was doing. But he was predestined so that God could get his glory. God could get his glory. So in conclusion, I want you to write this down as your third and final point. In conclusion. See, this brings us back to the original purpose of predestination. That we might fulfill God's plan for our lives in spite of ourselves. In spite of ourselves and ultimately bring glory to him. You see that? God graces us in spite of ourselves. That's amazing to me. You know, it says that, that, that in Romans 2, 4, that, that it's the goodness of God that brings a man to repentance. It's not his great power. It's not him scaring you into repentance. It's not him uh, threatening you with fire and brimstone that brings a man to repentance. It's not those things, but it's actually his goodness. That brings a man to repentance. I want to serve a God like that. Amen. See, that? I want to serve a God like that. That's His unconditional love, His loving kindness, His mercy endures forever. So I want to give you an opportunity right now to to make this God, Jesus, to be Lord of your life, if you haven't already. And if you if you uh, if you've been going astray, if you've been been uh, on a wayward path and it's been hard for you, this message might have brought light to you. I want to pray for you that you'll have a change of mind and a change of heart so that God can do some great things for you. But uh, I'm also going to pray for you if you, re if you refuse and you want to stay in your rebellion, that you would notice those earmarks <coughs> of God pre-planning some things for you. I want you to notice what God does for you that he's already planned out. Uh, knowing and anticipating the mistakes you're going to make. The bad decision that you're going to make. Uh, he's already playing something out for you that he can work that out for you. But don't continue to refuse his grace. Don't frustrate his grace. Uh, that goes for me too. I'm not fussing at you. Uh, that goes for all of us. And we can't continue to frustrate his grace because we can reach a point where God will just say, well, I'll let you, like Burger King, I'll let you have it your way. You see? And, and you really don't want it your way when it all, it's all said and done. Amen. Uh, so I want to pray for you right now. I'm going to give you an opportunity. And here's the altar up here if you want to come forward for prayer. Uh, I'll be glad to pray with you. And then we're going to pray for uh, those who've lost loved ones during the holiday. That God would meet them where they are. And that we would have a wonderful time this, this Christmas season. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you predestined our lives. That you've already prepared a way for us, uh, whether we're good or bad, whether we're obedient or, or whether we're in rebellion, Father. We want to thank you that your grace has already provided a way for us that we would be delivered from those things. So, Lord, we pray that you would, you would change our hearts and minds. If we're in the wrong way towards you, Lord, we repent of it right now. And we ask that you would, you would cause us to walk in your way, that you would give us a hunger and thirst 
after your righteousness, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would, you would change our perspective and help us to see things the way you do. Father, I pray for those out there who are going through tough times right now uh, due to their own rebellion or maybe even through ignorance, Father. I pray that you would, you would arrest them where they are and that you would turn them around and that you would show them the light of the gospel, that you would show them your way, that you would show them your call and make it clear to them, Father. We thank you for that. Thank you for softening their hearts so that they'll have ears to hear and obey. We, we pray for their, their turning towards you, Father, turning to you, uh, for, to fulfill your plan in their lives. And Father, we pray for all those who are, are dealing with sickness right now, and we send your blessing to them that you would correct all the problems in their bodies. We speak peace to every cell in those bodies right now. We command those bodies to hear the word of the Lord and receive the stripes of Jesus that we would be healed. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Uh, for those of you who've lost loved ones uh, during the holiday, uh, my, I send a special prayer for you. We've done the same thing we, we've lost uh, during these holidays. We see God has blessed us with new friends, new family. And uh, uh, as he takes care of our loved ones in heaven, we want to take care of one another here. So I'm going to pray for you right now, and then we're going to dismiss uh, as we do that. Uh, and we can fellowship after that. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for a special grace on those who've lost loved ones and friends uh, during this holiday. I pray for the Rosario family uh, who lost Tiffany this week. Lord, I pray that you would, you would, you would bear them up uh, under your wings, Lord, that you would comfort them in this time of sorrow. I pray for Kim, uh, who's lost her mother, and, 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 and Marty lost his mother on Christmas Eve, as well as Delaney and all those others who've lost those uh, closest to them during this, this time. And I pray that you would make this year special, that you would grace them with, with special love and attention. And, Lord, we pray that you would create new memories for us that we can cherish forever. And we thank you that they're in your care, those that we love. And we appreciate those who are here right now while they are because we know that that is not promised to us tomorrow, but we know that you hold tomorrow. So we trust you with that in Jesus' name. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet friendship of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now and forever. Let us all say it together. Amen. Amen. Amen.